All right. Good morning, everyone. You ready to roll? All right. A special welcome to those who are uh, streaming. We're glad you're finally up and uh, can, uh, can join us. Obviously not enough time to get ready and to get here, but we're still glad that you're here. All right. Just a little shame and guilt to get you here next week. Anyways, let me, uh, let me take you back uh, about 20 years. And uh, we had been in our house, well, we've been in our house for about 32 years now. So whatever. We've been in the house 10, 11 years. And uh, as neighbors, we started to notice this house a block behind us that was sort of falling apart a little bit. And uh, the, uh, the, the grass was getting longer and the bushes were starting to overgrow the house. Um, they started to put boards up over the windows. Some small little holes were being seen in the, in the roof. And uh, it hadn't been painted for a long time. It was just sort of peeling and it just did not look good. And so uh, the other thing we started to notice is that late at night, cars would pull up late in the middle of the night and someone would run into the house and then run back out. And we're going, ah, now we know what's going on. So some of the neighbors called the, 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 the local police, the Brookville police. And this was a big deal for them. And, um, and so they came out and they scoped it out. And sure enough, it was a drug house. So they, they did a raid and they, they took down the whatever you take down and they arrested them and took them away, all right? And uh, so then the house went up for sale just as is, all right? You're going to get it just the way it is, uh, which was a dump. And, um, and so someone bought it, and they came in. They got a bunch of dumpsters. Matter of fact, it looked just like our parking lot. I mean, there were just dump, dumpsters everywhere, right? And uh, they went in, and they just redid the whole house. They gutted it. They took it down to the studs, put on a new roof, new drywall, new plumbing, new electrical. Um, they had to redo some of the foundation. They, um, and then they put new nice wood floors in, repainted the whole thing, new carpet in certain sections, new roof. Maybe I said that already. Um, they, they burned away the grass. They put all new grass in, all new shrubbery, all new flowers. It was beautiful. All because the house was under new ownership. Someone bought it and then said, we're going to change it. We're going to make it new. And friends, if you would look at that house today, you would not recognize it as the house from 15 years ago. It's completely different. Well, that's what God wants to do in every one of our lives. He wants to come in as the new owner. He comes in and he takes up residence in our life and he begins to rehab us. He begins to change us. He begins to make us new again. And what we're going to do today is we're going to continue this story of John chapter 4, what Brian started last week. And Brian spent time talking about the encounter that Jesus had with the Samaritan woman. And if you have not listened to that message, you need to go back and listen to it for two reasons. One, it was phenomenal. It was just a great exposition of John chapter 4 and that encounter. But also it sets up what I'm going to talk about today. And what I'm going to talk about today will only make sense when you listen to what Brian talked about last week. It really is part one, part two. They go together so well. And so if you have your scriptures, I want you to turn with me to John chapter 4. We're going to, we're going to begin in verse 27. This is right where Brian finished last week. John chapter 4, verse 27. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? I mean, the disciples are truly in a state of denial. They just have no clue what's going on. Then leaving her water, her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the chance to gather together as your people. Father, we know that the church is not a place, it's not a building, but it's people, it's community, it's walking in life together. And I'm so grateful that this local body called Meadowbrook can gather together every single week to encourage one another, pray for one another, and walk through life together. I thank you for the chance we've had to, to sing songs to you, to worship you, to lift our voices and our eyes to you. I thank you that we can pray and we can talk with you. I'm grateful now for your word, which you have given to us. And Father, I pray that as we open your word and we look at this encounter by this woman with you and in the difference it made in her life, Father, I pray that it would be encouraging to each one of us. And I pray that, that, that you would miraculously speak 
to every single person here today, wherever we are in our journey with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, what this passage is going to do is talk to us and it's going to show us what a difference it makes when a person has an encounter with Jesus. Because I think so often people, and at least people who ask me, they go, well, what's the big deal? What difference does Jesus make? Is it, does it make any difference in your life? Sure, I have an a, a, a insurance policy for heaven, but, but what difference does it make here? How does it change my life? What does it do? Steve, come on, explain this to me. Well, here we go. John chapter 4, 27 on, this is one of the best passages I have ever taught from. I've never taught from it before, but I'm, I love it. There is so many good things in here, and I hope at the end you're going to be a little excited about this passage as well. So four things I want you to notice from this passage. Principle number one, when, when you come into it, when you have an encounter with Jesus, your, 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 your past is dealt with. Okay, look at the verse again. Look at it. Verse 28, then leaving her water jar. Now what's that? That's her past. That water jar represents her old life. The, the life that she has been defined by, all right? She's walking away from that. And the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Friends, here's what I want you to do right now. Underline it, circle it, and mark it. Even if it's the Pew Bible, I don't care. I want you to underline it, mark it, and circle it because everyone that reads that Bible in the future needs to see this verse. See, this woman was absolutely stunned, blown away by the fact that the God of heaven, the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior of the world had entered into her world and was talking to her, interacting with her, and in the end she discovers that this is the one who loves me and accepts me just the way I am. See, up until this point, this woman's life had been defined by her past. Her life was defined by her mistakes. Her life was defined by all the relationships that she had had. And as a result of that, she was living with guilt and shame. And that's why she couldn't go to the well in the morning or night. She had to go there in the middle of the day to avoid people, not to be around people, because they knew her story. They knew her reputation, and it wasn't a good reputation. And as a result of that, this woman was paralyzed by her past, and she was unable to move into the future. And friends, I really believe there are many good Christian men and women today we're experiencing the same thing in life. Unable to move into the future because they're paralyzed by their past. And we spend so much time wondering, can God really forgive that big sin? Can he really forgive what I did years ago? When I was, I had that angry outburst, when I had the affair, when I, I was, when I, I was selfish and prideful, when I bullied that other person at work, when I just powered up and I laid into them, we wonder, well, is God big enough to forgive me if I just keep on going back to the internet at night? Is God able to keep on forgiving me if I just can't be selfish? Is he going to give me a second chance? Does he give me a third chance? See, here's the main point. Many followers of Jesus today can never move into the future because they've not dealt with their past. And they're literally being paralyzed by it. It is an anchor that's weighing them down. But here's the good news. Jesus on the cross deals with with our past. He deals with all of our past. See, the, the beauty of the gospel is this, my friends. The beauty of the gospel is that the God of heaven looks down on mankind and he sees the way we're treating one another. He sees the way, the things that we're saying to each other, the way we're hurting each other. He sees the pain and the brokenness in the world today. He sees the orphan. He sees the widow. 
He sees the famine. He sees all that's going on. And he says, that's not the way I created it. That's not the way it's supposed to be. And so God, out of his scandalous love of the Father, sent his Son into the world. He gave up the very best that heaven had to offer. And he sent his Son into that world. And when Jesus hung and bled on the cross, he looked down on humanity. And just like the woman in John chapter 4, he saw everything we have done. He knows everything we have done. Every thought we have had, every word that we have spoken, every place that we have gone, everything we have done, Jesus knows it. And he was on that cross and he stayed there. And on that cross, he took every mistake, every shortcoming, every sin of yours and mine, past present and future, and it was nailed to the cross. He took it upon himself, eternal punishment. And he says to the world, I love you. And in that final breath, he said, it is finished. The word there is to tell us, paid in full, complete, done. The sin completely wiped away. There is nothing we can add to it, nothing we can take away from it. Everything we have ever done, every mistake, every time we fumbled the ball and run in the wrong direction, God says it's on the cross and it is paid in full. And friends, that's what the woman in John 4 discovered in her life. Her life had been defined by her past. But now, having accepted the grace and mercy of God, having thrown herself to him, she now walks in freedom into the future. And friends, that's exactly what God wants to do in every one of our lives. He wants to give us freedom from the past so we can live in joy in relationship with him and one another. I love the story of the the priest in the Philippines. And this young man had a, a growing church and, and the people loved him. He was so well loved by everyone. But yet at the same time, he was living with this, this burden that no one knew about, this, this secret sin that just sort of held him back from experiencing all that God wanted him to, 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 to be. And there was a woman in his church who said that she had dreams at night and in those dreams that God, Christ would come and they would talk to each other, that she would talk with Christ and Christ would talk to her. And the priest was like, mm, I'm not sure about that. Uh, he was a little skeptical about this whole thing. And so they're talking one day after church and he wanted to test her. He said, oh, ma'am, are you still having those, uh, those dreams where you talk with Christ? And uh, she said, oh, yeah, yeah, all the time. He goes, I I want you to do something this week. When you're talking to Christ, I want you to ask him, could you please tell me what sin my priest committed when he was in seminary? She said, sure, I'll ask him. So she went home that week, came back the next week. They're out in the steps of the church after, and the priest said, hey, did you have any of those dreams with Christ this week? She goes, oh, yeah, I did. Did you you ask him the question? Oh, 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 yeah, I did. I asked him, what, what sin did my priest commit when he was in seminary? And well, what did he say? He said, I don't remember. I don't remember. Because what God forgives, he forgets. Friends, we remember. We play the tapes over and over again, don't we? But in God's eyes, as far as the east is from the west, our sins are removed. This woman in John chapter 4, what difference did it make in her life? She was no longer going to be defined by her mistakes and by her past. She was now defined by the cross and his forgiveness in her life. And the same can be true of each one of us. The second thing I want you to notice in our story is that this woman now begins to live authentically. This woman had spent her entire life hiding, right? She was hiding because of her reputation because of her past. Friends, that's why she went to the well at noon. 
Normally, you would go to the well early in the morning or late at night because it was so hot at noontime. And so what she's doing is she's going at noon to avoid people, to avoid the people who knew her story, who knew her reputation. And she knew her reputation wasn't good. As a result of that, she was an outcast. She had been pushed out. She had been shunned by the people. She wasn't accepted because they knew who she was. But here's the amazing part of this entire story. When she has an encounter with Jesus, she doesn't have to hide anymore. This man knows everything about me. He's brought it out into the open. And here's the cool thing. The thing that she had been hiding from is what she's actually talking about now. She's living authentically. She goes, no more hiding. I can just be real. I can be who I am. I don't have to avoid people because I know that Christ accepts me just the way I am. And friends, that's the gospel story. That's it. It's the most beautiful, wonderful, amazing story the world has ever known, is that God accepts us just the way we are. We don't have to pretend. We don't have to put on our masks. We don't have to be imposters. We don't have to be posers. We don't have to try to gain his approval. We don't have to try to look good in front of God because he knows everything. He, there are no secrets in our life. He knows it all. And you know what he says? I love you. I accept you just the way you are. And friends, when you begin to understand that, you don't have to hide anymore. And yet she's not the first one to hide, is she? <laughs> Hiding goes back a few thousand years to our great, 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 great grandparents, Adam and Eve. And in Genesis chapter 3, after they sinned, what did they do? They hid. They hid. And man has been hiding ever since. We hide behind our homes, we hide behind our titles, we hide behind our positions, we hide behind our sports, we hide behind our successes, we hide behind our kids, we hide behind our kids' teams. We hide. We become experts at hiding. Why? Because if we tell people who we really are, if we share our problems and our struggles, they may not like us. They may not accept us. And then what do I do? Well, friends, church in the community is the place where we can come together and where the masks can come off and we can walk in authenticity and be real and honest with one another. We don't have to hide and pretend anymore. I love the story of the two brothers. And these brothers were very wealthy. They owned a construction company. And, and every Sunday they'd come to church and they sat right here in the front row, right there, boom, boom, all right? And, uh, and they would stand up and sing the songs and put their hands in the air. And then they'd get on their knees and they would pray and stand up, sit down, fight, fight, fight. I mean, they knew the whole routine, all right? They knew what you had to do at church to fit in, all right? They had figured the deal out. The problem was Monday through Saturday, they lived like heck. I mean, they were just wild guys, all right? Well, a new pastor comes into town. And, and they're, the, build, the church is in the middle of a, a renovation project. Now, there's no relationship between here and the story. Don't worry. Don't worry. And so they're in this renovation project, and one of the brothers dies very unexpectedly at a young age. And so the other brother goes to the pastor. He says, hey, I got a deal for you. He says, I know you know who we are. You know the, you know the deal. You know we're just faking it. So here's what I want you to do. I'm going to write a check right now for $2 million dollars. It's going to cover the whole renovation. We're done. But if I write you the check, I want you to tell everyone at the funeral that my brother was a saint. Now that put the, the pastor in a dicey situation. Went to the bank, put the check in, and he went to the funeral. Get to the end of the funeral, he puts his hand on the coffin. I want everyone to know that this man right here, he was a cheat, swindler, liar, bully, drunk, adulterer. But compared to his brother, he was a saint. <laughs> Friends, as followers of Jesus, we don't have to fake it anymore. Because we're the beloved. We're the beloved. Fully accepted and loved 
by him. And as we walk into community with one another, as we lock arms and we say we're going to go through life together, we can be honest and real with one another. Because we are not defined by our mistakes. We're defined by God's forgiveness. We're not defined by our accomplishments, but Christ's accomplishment on the cross. We're not defined by what the world says, but what Christ says. We're not defined by what others say about us. We're defined by what Christ says about us. We're not defined by current events. We're defined by our future with Christ. We have nothing to prove, nothing to gain, and nothing to lose because we are his and he is ours. So what's the application? Let me just give you one. One of the things that Meadowbrook is built on that's foundational to this church are small groups, neighborhood communities, men's groups, women's groups. I just want to encourage you, if you are not connected, if you are not in a group, to, to join one of those groups because it's in community where you will reach your Become, reach your, your spiritual potential. You'll be able to become all that God wants you to be. But the other beautiful thing about living in community is that there's no perfect people allowed. We're all imperfect. We all have warts. We all have scars. We all have wounds. And when you come together in community with four or five other women or four or five other guys or, or three or four other couples, you can begin to, to share with one another. See, when you get together in community, the masks come off. It's the place where your doubts can be shared. It's where tenderness flows, where acceptance happens, where prayers are made. You don't run from your problems, you share your problems. You no longer have to be superficial and fake it. You can be who you are. And so I just want to encourage you to get connected if you're not, to find that place. And you, there's a connection center right out there. You can go there after the service and talk about what might that look like. Okay, but let's get on to our third point. This woman is a different woman. Her past has been dealt with. She can live authentically. And then third, now she, ha she understands she has a role to play in the kingdom. This might be the most amazing part of the whole story. This is the part I love the most. Here is a woman who goes from an encounter with Jesus to now engaging the world for Jesus. See, here's what I, I, it blows me away about this story. The disciples, these guys have been with Jesus the longest, right? They know him the best, and what have they done? Nothing. They haven't brought anyone. This woman knows Jesus for a few moments, and all of a sudden, she's going into the town, and she's bringing people to Jesus. She's pointing them to Jesus. She understands she was made for a purpose. She has a role to play. And her role is to tell others about Jesus. And so what happens? Just like what Brian talked about last week, right? He talked about how Jesus had this encounter with this woman, that he crossed cultural bounds, that he crossed racial bounds, that he took the initiative, he engaged in a conversation, he asked for help. Listen to the tape. It's so much better than what I just said. But this woman obviously had listened to his message because she did everything Brian said to do. She went back to her town. Here's the point. She went back to the people that she had been avoiding. And she starts to tell them her story. The story of what God had done in her life. This man, he knows everything about me and he loves me. He accepts me. And it says that they went and they began to believe, not because of her word, but because of of his word, word. And it finishes by saying he truly was the savior of the world. Friends, that's what God does. God specializes in taking ordinary people like you and I and doing the extraordinary. God doesn't worry about our past. He doesn't worry about the mistakes we've made. He says, I just want you. I want a, a fully surrendered heart. And if you give me your heart and you give me your life, you just go back to your school, go back to your neighborhood, go back to your club, go back to those family and friends and just begin to tell your story and begin to point people to Jesus.
That's what John the Baptist did back in the last chapter, chapter 3. What did John the Baptist say? He must increase and I must decrease. John the Baptist was pointing people to Jesus. The woman at the well is pointing people to Jesus. It's going to be the rhythm we're going to see all throughout the Gospel of John. It's what God does best. It's the story of the Bible, my friends. It's Joseph. Joseph was a dreamer, and God sent him to be an administrator in Egypt. Moses was a stutterer, and God sent him to talk to Pharaoh. David was a shepherd, and God sent him to the throne. Peter was a fisherman, and God sent him to plant a church. Matthew was an accountant, and God made him an author. Luke was a doctor, and God sent him on a mission trip. Paul was a Jew, and he sent him to speak to the Gentiles. Nehemiah was a cupbearer, and God sent him to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. God takes us right where we're at and puts us right back into our world, and he says, God, friends, I'm going to use you right there. I'll use you right there. Where do I start? You start with your story, just like the woman did. You start with your story. I said it a few weeks ago when I was here. Every one of you has a story a story of what God has done in your life. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be highly theological. It's just your story. What has God done in your life? And begin to tell that story. Learn it. Write it out. In your community group, begin to share it with one another. Because no one can argue with it. It's your story. It's your story. And no one can argue. And then the fourth principle we see here in this, this woman's life is not only was her past forgiven, not only was she able to live authentically, not only does she understand her role in the kingdom, but then forth, Jesus says, live with a sense of urgency. Look what it says here in verse 34. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. See, the disciples had brought him a happy meal and all they're concerned about is making sure his stomach is full. The woman is concerned about bringing people to, to the living water. And Jesus says, no, my, my, my work is not finished. My work is to do the will of the Father. Do not save four more months than the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes. Look at the fields. They are ripe for harvests. So how does Jesus end this whole thing? He says, look. He says, Take your eyes off your problems. Take your eyes off your circumstances. Take your eyes after all that's going on in the world and lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes and look. And what do you see? You see people. People. Children. Grade school people. Middle school students. High school students. College age students. I see men. see women. see couples. We see those in senior living facilities. Those in prison. We see people. Jesus says, so don't say wait. Don't say, oh, four more months till the harvest. No, 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 no. An effective farmer, a good farmer, they know their crops. They know their fields. And when they see something, they know when it's ready to harvest. And when it's ready, you go. You don't wait. That's what he's saying here now. He's saying, you go. He's saying, begin to see the world as I see the world. Begin to feel what I feel. And may our hearts be broken by the things that break the hearts of God. He says, begin to live with a sense of urgency because the fields are ripe for harvest. Friends, all you have to do is look around. Don't major on the problems. Look for the opportunities. How can we better engage students? How can we better engage men? How can we better engage women? How can we better engage couples? Just look up. Look up. And pray that your heart would be broken by the things that break the heart of God. Pray that you would see people, situations, and circumstances as he sees them. Pray that you begin to feel the hurt and the pain that God feels in his heart about the condition of the world. What Jesus is saying to the disciples, and he's saying to us as well, we need to start to live with a sense of urgency. We need to stop saying, oh, don't worry about it. It's no big deal. No, it is a big deal. He says, look at the world as I see the world. A number of years ago, gosh, probably 25 years ago, 
uh, Colleen and I, every year, spring break, we'd take our kids down to, to, to Fort Myers Beach to see Colleen's parents. And we went there for two reasons. One, it was a free vacation, other than the gas to get there. And, and second, we wanted to see our parents. And um, so we had done this year after year after year after year. Well, our uh, kids at that time were probably about 11, we four kids, you know, 11 to four, whatever that, whatever, however they all were. And um, I just know our youngest, Johnny, was four. And we thought, okay, now we can go to Disney World. So we told the kids when we got down there, we're going to go to Disney World. We are going to take out a second mortgage on our house, <laughs> and we're going to go for one day. That's it, one day. All right, that's it. That's all you get. Okay, we are going to get there when it opens. We'll leave when it closes. So we got up real early in the morning, made the three-hour drive up to, to Orlando, and we were at the gate. And the whole time we're driving, the kids got their maps out and their graphs, and they're looking how they're going to plan the day and where they're going to go. And, you know, we were all rookies to this thing. And... Uh, and so we go in and we start, and, and John was only four at the time, and John had a tendency to roam, all right? Very adventurous young man. And so uh, one of us, Colleen and I, always had to have John's hand. And so we're going through the whole day, and we're doing great. We get done with dinner, now we're in line. And I don't know, we're in line for more autographs, like Mickey and Minnie and whoever, I don't know. And we're, you know, it's 7, 8 o'clock at night now, and, and I look over at Kyle and I go, hey, where's, where's Johnny? And she goes, well, it's your turn. I go, no, I don't have him. So we did that back and forth thing a little bit. You know, you've, you've been there. And finally he said, okay, Johnny's gone. So we took the three kids. We sat them down on the park bench. We said, you three, you pray. That's your job. You just pray right now that the lost will be found. All right? <laughs> and I told Kyle, I said, okay, Kyle. I said, you're going to go that way, and I'm going to go that way. We'll meet back here in 10 minutes, and we'll see who's got Johnny. All right? And so, so she goes, and I'm going, okay, hey, John, hey, John, where are you? Hey, John, John, I'm looking, John, hey, John, you anywhere, buddy? Hey, John, come on, John, let's go, time to go, come on, John. Well, we come back in 10 minutes, and, and there's no John. She doesn't have him, and I don't have him. So we, now it's been, you know, 15, 20 minutes, we thought, oh, goodness, we probably should do something. So, uh, so we call security, and you show them a picture, right? And, uh, you know, and then, you know, things happen really quick, right? I mean, they shut down the gates, and you got to show your bands, and every Mickey and Minnie becomes an undercover cop. And, I mean, it's just the whole nine yards. And, uh, and, and, and so uh, I told Kyle, I said, okay, now this time you go that way, and I'll go this way, and we'll see if we can find John. Well, now, you know, we're 20, 25 minutes into this thing, and you're starting to get a little nervous, a little stressed out. You know, your, your kid's gone. You don't know where they are. You know, they could be in Guatemala by now. I don't know. But anyways, I'm just getting worried. And so I just, uh, you know, I, I get down here now, and I'm going, hey, John, John, hey, John, John. I'm screaming at the top of my lungs. Because that which I love more than anything in the world is lost. They're gone. And I want Johnny back more than anything in the world. So we get back, and there's John. I go, where'd you find him? She goes, well, I went this way, and I went into the store, and in the back of the store, there were all these stuffed animals, and Johnny was sitting on the ground. And he had a little Simba stuffed animal on his lap. And she goes, I just started the ball. And Johnny looked up and said, Mom, what's wrong? <laughs> See, Johnny had no idea he was lost. None. As far as he was concerned, everything was well in the universe. Friends, there are six billion people on the face of this earth who do not know they're lost. They do not know they're going to spell, spend eternity separated from God. And they're searching, and they're looking, they're confused, they're hurting, they're broken, they're in pain, and they need Jesus. And Jesus says to the disciples, and I think he says to us, lift up your eyes, look at the harvest. Look at the harvest, Meadowbrook. Look at the schools right here. Look at your neighborhoods. Look at the places that you work. Begin to see the world as Jesus sees the world. Begin to feel what Jesus begins to feel. And may we be a people who walk out of here on a Sunday morning, knowing that our past is dealt with, living authentically with one another, understanding that every one of us has the potential to point people to Jesus and living with a sense of urgency. John chapter 4, part 1, part 2, the difference Jesus can make when he comes into a person's life. Let's pray. 
Thank you, Lord, for your presence here today. Thank you for the opportunity to open this passage and to look at this story and just the incredible truths that are found in it. And Father, I, I pray for every single person here right now. Maybe there may be some that are just uh, paralyzed by something they've done in the past. Father, I pray that they would know that you have forgiven them. That if they confess their sin, that you will forgive it and cleanse them of it. Father, I pray that you would help each one of us to take off our masks and just to be honest and real and stop being fakes. Father, I pray that you help every one of us to discover and know that we have a kingdom purpose, that we're here for a reason. And finally, Father, I pray that you would break our hearts with the things that break yours. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>